Hi students, we are so excited to continue learning together. Today's video is all about a very special baleen whale that visits these incredible waters known as the Salish Sea. Today we're going to learn about a humpback whale. We have a special guest here to teach us about these amazing marine mammals. Her name is Erin Johns Gless and we can't wait to introduce you to her and the humpback whales that depend on these marine waters. Hello students, my name is Erin Gless and I'm a naturalist with the Pacific Whale Watch Association. Today I'm going to be teaching you about some of my very favorite whales, humpbacks of the Salish Sea. There are two types of whales, toothed whales or odontocetes and baleen whales or mysticetes. Mysticetes or baleen whales do not have teeth and instead in their mouths they have plates of something called baleen that they use to filter their food. Here in the Salish Sea, we have a few different types of baleen whales that visit our waters. Gray whales, minke whales, occasionally fin whales, and humpback whales. Humpback whales in the Salish Sea have a very interesting recovery story. We know that humpback whales used to live in the Salish Sea and their bones have been found in archaeological digs dating back at least 1500 years. The First Nations of this area used to hunt humpback whales on occasion, but this was a very sustainable hunt. They would use all of the bones, the baleen, the blubber, and the meat, and nothing went to waste. Unfortunately, when European whalers came to this area with their steam engines and their exploding harpoons, they removed humpback whales at an unsustainable rate. And by the early 1900s, there were zero humpback whales left in the Salish Sea. After that, many decades passed, but whaling continued along the outer coast. And it wasn't until 1972 that the commercial hunting of humpback whales was made illegal here in North America. For the next few decades, there were occasionally one or two sightings of humpback whales in Puget Sound, but it wasn't until 1997 when an individual nicknamed Big Mama, a humpback whale, was photographed off of Victoria, Canada. It was actually such a rare event that the photographer submitted the photo to the newspaper in Victoria and they refused to print it because they thought that it had to be a false photograph. But it was not. It was a very real whale. Again, that whale was nicknamed Big Mama because she has brought at least six calves with her back to the Salish Sea over the last decade. And in fact, she was just seen last week returning for yet another season. As I mentioned, we have a few different types of baleen whales that live here in the Salish Sea. Gray whales and minke whales can be differentiated from humpback whales in a few ways. Humpback whales, in general, are quite large, about the size of a school bus, so they are larger than minke whales. Humpback whales, while being about the same size as a gray whale, are much darker in color, a dark gray, almost black, whereas gray whales are a light gray. The other difference is their dorsal fin. Humpback whales have a small but visible dorsal fin on their back that resembles a hump, hence their name humpback whales, whereas gray whales have no dorsal fin and minke whales have a much more prominent dorsal fin. While it's possible to see humpback whales at any time of year in the Salish Sea, we tend to see most of them during the months of April through October. This is because humpback whales are a migratory species, spending the summer months in cold waters where they feed and traveling in the winter months to warm waters where they give birth to their young or mate. Here in the Salish Sea, we have humpback whales from three different breeding populations, Hawaii, Mexico, and Central America. Every winter, humpback whales travel thousands of miles to these breeding grounds, where they'll socialize with other humpback whales or give birth to their calves. If a humpback whale is not yet giving birth to a calf, they'll typically mate with another humpback whale, return to their feeding grounds, and then give birth the following year because their gestation period is approximately 11 to 12 months. When it comes to identifying individual humpback whales, we primarily use their tail or flukes. Each humpback whale is born with unique color markings on their tail that are just like our fingerprints. 
By the time the whale's about two or three, they're fairly obvious, and they don't change much throughout the whale's life. When the whale dives down, we're able to see the underside of their tail, take a photo, and use that to identify the individual. Not every humpback whale shows their tail when they dive, and so we are able to occasionally identify based on their dorsal fin. In order to make an ID, we would need either a very good photograph of the underside of the whale's tail, or ideally, a perfectly perpendicular shot of the whale's dorsal fin. Scientists, when they discover a new humpback whale, will typically give it an identification number. And these identification numbers can vary depending on where exactly that humpback whale was first seen. There's a few different research organizations that give humpback whales their ID numbers. As far as nicknames, we do occasionally nickname some of our humpback whales, and usually that honor goes to the first person that sees that humpback whale. So if you are out and you take a photograph of a humpback whale, you submit it to researchers and no one has ever seen that whale before, oftentimes they will allow you to give that whale a nickname if you'd like. One of the reasons that humpback whales were able to make such a successful recovery after the stop of commercial whaling was that they eat a variety of different foods. They're not picky eaters. They feed on krill, which are tiny little shrimp-like crustaceans, as well as many different types of bait fish, like herring, sardines, anchovies, and candlefish. Now, as far as how they eat, they are a member of a type of whales called the rorquals, which means their throat can expand and they can take very large gulps of water. Once they do that, they'll close their mouth, They'll slowly trickle out the water and all those little krill or fish will get stuck in between those baleen plates that act just like a sieve. So they'll spit out the water, the fish or krill will get stuck in the baleen and then they'll use their giant tongues to scrape everything out, just like if you have broccoli stuck in your teeth. As we learn more about humpback whales, we're finding that some of them have developed unique feeding strategies. For example, lunge feeding, where they dive down and then come up to the surface quickly with their mouths open to trap fish. We also know that in some places, like Alaska, they'll work together to use a method called bubble net feeding, where they'll dive down, blow bubbles, and use those bubbles to scare fish towards the surface so they can feed. A new method called trap feeding is starting to be observed in North Vancouver Island, when trap feeding, humpback whales sit at the surface with their mouth open for an extended period of time and simply wait for the fish to swim into their mouth before closing it. We have not seen trap feeding in the Salish Sea yet, but humpback whales do learn from each other, so we're keeping an eye to see if it spreads down to the Salish Sea. While we're no longer commercially hunting humpback whales, they still face some human-related threats. There are three primary threats for humpback whales today. Entanglement, ship strike, and pollution. Right now, we think that entanglement in fishing gear is the number one cause of mortality of humpback whales on the west coast of the United States. As humpback whales migrate up and down the coast, they come across different types of fishing gear, such as ghost nets, which are fishing nets that have been discarded, lobster traps down in California when they're fishing for spiny lobster, and Dungeness crab pots off the Pacific Northwest. As the humpback whales are migrating through, sometimes they may catch one of the lines on the fishing gear and get wrapped up. At times, humpback whales are able to shed the fishing gear on their own, but sometimes if it's a severe entanglement, entanglement crews are launched to assist and they can cut the ropes off. Unfortunately, only about 50% of all of the entanglements are able to be successfully resolved. And we do think that many humpback whales, unfortunately, pass away due to complications from being entangled in fishing gear. The second major threat to humpback whales is ship strike, or being hit by vessels. This can be either large vessels, like shipping traffic or cruise ships, or small vessels, like recreational boats, where the propellers can be damaging to the whales. The third major threat to humpback whales is pollution. This can be pollution from microplastics because the small fish that the humpback whales eat can ingest plastic, which might accumulate in their body. Or this could be large scale pollution like plastic bags or balloons or other types of marine debris that the humpback whales might ingest when they're feeding. 
Unfortunately, they can't digest this plastic, and so it accumulates in their body, and eventually they're unable to digest their food and pass away. Now, when it comes to these three threats, there are things that you can do at home to help protect humpback whales. One thing that you can do to help prevent entanglements is purchase sustainable seafood. Know where your seafood was caught and the method that was used to catch it. Preventing ship strikes is a bit tricky. If you happen to live in this area and have a boat, one thing we recommend is that if you see a blow, go slow. Look for humpback whales by their tall spouts. And if you see them, make sure that you're operating at a speed of less than seven knots to make sure that the whales are safe. As far as preventing large vessel ship strikes, one thing that you can do is shop locally. 90% of all the international goods that we use in the United States arrive on large shipping vessels. If you are able to shop more locally, we can perhaps reduce the amount of shipping vessels on the water. A new initiative here in Washington was the whale warning flag. If you or your friends have boats and are on the water in the Salish Sea, you can get a whale warning flag through the San Juan County Marine Resources Committee. This flag should be displayed anytime there are whales nearby and lets other vessels in the area know to slow down and keep an eye out for whales in the area. The easiest thing that you can do at home to reduce the threat of pollution to humpback whales is reduce the use of single-use plastics. This includes things like plastic shopping bags or plastic water bottles, which can easily be ingested by humpback whales that are feeding if they happen to be in the water. One of the tools that we use to learn more about where the humpback whales of the Salish Sea go in the wintertime is Happy Whale. HappyWhale.com is a free tool that anyone can use. If you're able to take a photograph of a humpback whale's tail, you can upload it to HappyWhale.com and they'll run it through their database to see if that whale has ever been seen before or cataloged by researchers. If so, you'll get a notification showing when and where that whale was seen before. Thanks to Happy Whale, we've learned that here in the Salish Sea, we have three different populations of humpback whales that feed here. The Hawaiian population, which is not endangered, the Mexican population, which is still considered threatened, and the Central American population, which as of right now is considered to still be an endangered population of humpback whales. This means that the Salish Sea is a very important feeding ground for endangered whales, which is all the more reason that they need to be protected in our waters. Now that you've had a chance to learn about one of my favorite animals, the humpback whale, I'm excited for you to get out on a boat and see the waters that they call home.